All right, hello, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, good evening, I don't know, whenever you're watching this video, hello, hello, hello. So yesterday there were a lot of uh, uh, bills that were heard in the Select Committee on Community Safety. And uh, of course, uh, as you know, I'm still dealing with this uh, root canal, so I wasn't there to testify. I did send in um, something that I had hoped uh, would be read um, but Rick did a good job of uh, bringing his own uh, his own flavor into it and representing Open Carry Texas in a in a good way at the committee uh, on this bill. So the the bill that I was really interested in yesterday was the uh, twenty seven oh five by Hayes was the big one, and that was essentially removing short barreled rifles from the the law in texas so uh, uh you know bruin would be going away or bruin is making the nfa largely uh go away and so i wanted to talk about how um even without this law uh i firmly believe that the prohibition on short-barreled rifles has already been ruled unconstitutional by uh the supreme court and so I want to talk about that because um, it's it's kind of very important. If you go back and you read the United States v. Miller case, this is a, a 1939 case. Um, and if you're looking for the citation, it's 307 U.S. 174. Yeah, 307 U.S. 174. And uh, or you can go 59 S. Court or Supreme Court uh, 816 is the other citation for that, the, the more recent citation. But, you know, in, in Miller, the Supreme Court was presented with the constitutionality of the NFA as it related to uh, the defendant's possession of a short-barreled shotgun in this case. Um, in that decision, the court held that the NFA prohibition on the possession of a short-barreled shotgun was constitutional. But it should be noted that the two defendants, there were two defendants in this case, they had no representation before the Supreme Court because what happened, these they you know, ran off before the case was heard. They were never heard from in court again, other than their uh, plea bargain uh, deal that they did. Um, and so no one represented their side of the case um, before the Supreme Court that day that Miller was heard. And uh, by the way, Miller was also murdered uh, prior to the decision, the Miller, the Miller decision. So um, when no one represents your side before the Supreme Court, the court, the court refers that to that as a no appearance for appellees. Um, that's what they referred to here. So only the government's arguments were heard in the Miller case. So regardless of your position necessarily on uh, the Miller case, you know, if you're on the gun control side and say, look, see, this this upholds it. Well, um, OK, but keep in mind, only one side was was heard. They, they, there was no nothing presented on the other side because the uh, the appellees had no representation at the Supreme Court. And so uh, what the Supreme Court held was that without better evidence, they couldn't make a better determination, right? All they could do was go off of what the state was presenting. And so there was never any evidentiary hearing on whether a short barreled shotgun was a militia type weapon and protected from registration and taxation by the second amendment. Um, so, well, CJ, if that's the case, why are you bringing this up? Well, because regardless of what side you're on, if you believe that the Supreme court in Miller said, look, see, it says here that uh, it's the, 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 the government can regulate short-barreled shotguns and rifles. Uh, okay, I've got a response for that um, that actually works in our favor, the Second Amendment favor. And if you're someone that says, well, it didn't say that because, you know, it wasn't a, uh, you know, all the evidence wasn't presented. Well, that works in our favor too. So either argument that you have with regard to Miller and the NFA and short barreled rifles and shotguns, the Miller case supports um, actually the right to own and possess without government interference, a short barreled rifle or shotgun. I'm going to talk about that today. So the lower court, when it went up to the Supreme court, 
uh, took no evidence concerning the nature or usability of a short barreled shotgun. And as you know, the Supreme Court does not take evidence. So and the case had no record on the central point, which is the central point is the usefulness of a short barreled rifle or shotgun. OK, that's the central point that 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 was not made because of the way that this this went out. So the court held the Supreme Court held in Miller that because the case had not presented any evidence of the military usefulness of the weapon, that there was, excuse me, no way to say that there was a reasonable relationship between pose possession of a short barreled shotgun and the present, uh, the, uh, the preservation, uh, here's the quote, um, the preservation of efficiency of a well-regulated militia. So specifically justice McReynolds who wrote the opinion in Miller held that quote in, in the absence of any evidence tending to show that possession of or use of a shotgun having a barrel of less than 18 inches in length at this time has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument. Now, uh, what I want to do here is uh, bring in, um, bring this in. This is the Miller case. Here is the uh, the section I just kind of quoted right here. So in the absence of any evidence tending to show the possession or use of a shotgun having a barrel less than 18 at this time, okay, at this time has reasonable relationships to the preservation. Now remember, this is the absence of evidence. Has any some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia? We cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument. Certainly, it is not within judicial notice that this weapon is any part of the ordinary military equipment or that its use was contribute to the common defense. Okay, this was 1939. All right. Um, and this is very important because, again, the, certainly the court said it is not within judicial notice that this weapon is any part of the ordinary military equipment or that its use could contribute to the common defense. Today, short barreled rifles and shotguns are in common use, both in the military and in the private sectors. These weapons don't uh, make their accuracy or efficiency any better or worse. Obviously, the shorter the barrel, uh, the less distance you're going to get on a short barreled rifle. And so, you know, if you want to go longer distances, you're going to have to adjust your elevation because a short barreled rifle, uh, the shorter the barrel, uh, it loses a lot of that uh that feet per second um, in the long run. Um, so they actually are better for self-defense and because of these tight quarters. Now, I'm going to go into this Miller case a little bit more, but I wanted to quote a few things that have been said about the Miller case. For example, in, in DC versus Heller, Justice Scalia reiterated that Miller quote is not only consistent with, but positively suggests that the Second Amendment confers an individual uh, right to keep and bear arms, though only arms that, quote, have some reasonable relationship to the pre preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia. That's this part right here. OK. Right there. Now, this is a good thing. Don't don't think that this is a bad thing that you know, it has nothing to do with the militia. Keep in mind, the Second Amendment has two clauses. It has the militia clause and it has the individual right clause. OK, the individual right clause is sort of a reason for the uh, well-regulated militia. I mean, you you can't have a well-regulated militia if you don't have uh, the individual right to keep and bear arms. Now, today, the M4 rifle is the main small arms rifle in use in the military alongside uh, some of the, 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 the hangers-on M16s that are out there. Now, the M16 has a 20-inch barrel. That's the standard, okay? The standard M16 in the military is a 20 inch barrel. The M4, which is now the most commonly used firearm in uh, the military. Hey, Felix, uh, if you'd like to donate, um, you can let me know. I, I think in the in the comments it should have down there um, how to donate. Uh, if I've got a if I've got a, a mod on, if you could help share that, but. So the M4 has a 14 and a half inch standard barrel. Okay, the barrel length, 14 and a half inch. I started out when I joined the army, I had an M16, big ass, long ass rifle with the you know hard stock. 
Um, and then by the time I left the military, we had transitioned to the M4 with a collapsible stock um, or an adjustable stock. And so if you look at the definition of a short barreled rifle under 18 USC 922, um, it's the term short barreled rifle means a rifle having one or more barrels less than 16 inches in length and any weapon made from a rifle, whether by alteration, modification or otherwise, if such weapon is modified. Uh, has an overall length of less than 26 inches. So the barrel length of less than 16 inches and an overall length of less than 26 inches. So here's what I want to show you uh, before we go into this. This is the M4 carbine, okay? This is the same kind of M4 that the military, at least the Army, uh, uses right here. The barrel length, uh, this isn't the... Uh, this isn't the right one. Where's the... Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. That's the civilian version. Dang it, I know I brought this up. This is the civilian version. I was looking up all the uh, all the statistics. Hang on. Well, anyway, uh, the, the M4 has a standard barrel length. And y'all can Google this yourself, okay? Yeah, you don't need me to... I, I thought I had opened up that already uh, and had it in reserve ready to go. Let me see if I had it somewhere else. Nope, not there. Okay, so regardless. So now that, so here's here's where I want to get back to this case because in 1939, what was the general weapon, the, the big weapon that was used in the military? What was the standard rifle? It was uh, the M1 Garand was the main uh, rifle for the military. And of course, that's a, a longer barreled rifle. In 1939, that's what you had. You didn't have these short barreled rifles. You didn't have these short barreled shotguns. And so uh, nowadays, though, since the, I would say, when did they start doing that? I guess around 2000 is when they started uh, really transitioning from the M16 to the M4 in the Army, if I remember correctly. Um, and you went from a 20-inch barrel to a 14-and-a-half-inch barrel, which is a short-barreled rifle. So when you get into the Miller opinion, this is where I think uh, – this is where I think that regardless of what side you're on, the Miller case, which a lot of the left loves to quote, the, the left loves to quote the Miller case as saying, see, the Supreme Court has already held that um, the government has the right to regulate short barreled rifles and shotguns. Now, this case, Miller, OK, the, these were the two defendants right here, Jack Miller and Frank Layton, not that Jack Miller. This was a different Jack Miller. Um, they were the defendants. Um, that's why it's called the Miller case. He was the lead defendant on this. So uh, he was convicted of transporting, you know, he, he basically had in his possession a double barreled 12 gauge Steven shotgun with a barrel less than 18 inches of length. And what he did not have is a tax stamp right here. He did not have the tax stamp. So keep in mind, short barreled rifles and short barreled shotguns, they're not illegal. You just have to pay the government a tax to own it, okay? An additional tax. Anybody can own a short-barreled shotgun as long as they're not a prohibited person or a rifle. As long as you got the $200 uh, poll tax, I'm sorry, Second Amendment tax that you pay to uh, own that short-barreled rifle. Now, if you go down into the opinion, I've highlighted some very, uh, you know, this, this talks about the history of it and all, all that. And here's the law, you know, for the purposes of this act. This is the NFA. Um. We get down here, and these are the important things. So they do a discussion here about, you know, the Second Amendment, which is similar to what was done in the Heller case, similar to what was done in the Bruin case, okay? Even in 1939, the Supreme Court, and, and you, you listen to the talking heads on the gun control side, and they talk about how, oh, you know, the Supreme Court has always said that this was a militia right, this was a collective right. They've never held this as... An individual right well that's absolutely false because this the miller case again from 1939 and it quotes several acts from the 1600s and the 1700s it, it quotes uh english law about the individual right to keep and bear arms so um i already covered that section right there but right here the sentiment of the time talking about when in 1791 when the second amendment was applied thank you felix was applied they strongly disfavored standing armies. Now, if we're going to talk about 
this idea that the founding fathers could have never envisioned, you know, the types of guns that are used today. Well, the standing, the founding fathers also uh, had a, a an incredible distrust and uh, lack of love for a standing army. And that was the purpose for the militia because of their distrust of a standing army. They realized that the people needed to be armed and they needed to be armed so that there could be a militia, right? A militia. The common view was that adequate defense of the countries and laws could be secured through the militia. And look at this civilians, primarily civilians, primarily soldiers on occasion. That's what the Miller case says. That's what makes that, uh, you know, when it, it's completely um, dishonest for the left to claim that up until just recently, you know, the Heller and McDonald cases, that the Supreme Court held that the Second Amendment was a collective right. No, it wasn't. If you look at Article One of the Constitution, the Congress has the duty the duty as one of their functions of Congress is to arm the militias, okay, to arm the militia. So Congress already has that duty to arm the military and the militia. So if they already have that duty, why do you even need the Second Amendment if you believe that the Second Amendment is only a collective right? If you only believe that the Second Amendment applies to the militia, then it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary because Article One of our Constitution already says that the uh, government is re is supposed to arm the militia, okay? But, or it, especially in comes times of common defense, okay? For the common defense. So if you're going to bring soldiers together for the common defense, then the federal government has to have a, a mechanism by which to arm that militia. But that still uh, shows right here that it's civilians. It's not militiamen. Civilians make up the militia. Now, the significant attributed, the, the signification attributed to the term militia appears from the debates in the conviction of history and the legislation of colonies and the writings approved by commentaries. These writings, right? This writings, these debates, the history show plainly enough that the militia comprised all males, all males physically capable of acting in concert for the common defense. Okay. All males have the right to keep and bear arms. Now, obviously, all women do as well. Thank you, Jorge. Appreciate you. And it says, a body of citizens enrolled for military discipline. Okay? Further, that ordinarily, when called for service, these men were expected to appear bearing arms, supplied by themselves, and of the kind, this is important, in common use at the time. At the time. If the founding fathers wanted uh, the Second Amendment only to apply to muskets, they would have said that. If they only wanted it to apply to bows and arrows, they would have said that. This term right here, at the time, means that they recognize, you know, anyone that says that, oh, they never envisioned today's weapons. They never envisioned the you know, destructive power of today's uh, rifles and pistols is very willfully ignorant in thinking that the founding fathers didn't believe in progress. They didn't in, uh, agree uh, or understand tech technological advances or advancing in society or anything like that. So this is very specific that at the time, weapons in common use. And as I said, this was, uh, oh, I'm sorry, here's the, the definitions of short-barreled shotgun, short-barreled rifle, just so you know. It's a short barrel shotgun, one or more barrels, 18 inches long or less. Now for a rifle, it's 16. I don't know where these numbers come from. They're just made up out of thin air. Um, but I opened this up just so you could see what the definition of, uh, of these was. Um, or 26 inches. So both. So your, your shotgun couldn't be less than 18 inches uh, barrel length. And then 20, it had to be more than 26 inches overall. Your rifle was 16 inches and 26 inches overall. So those are just the definitions there. Here's the, uh, I, I brought up the um, original National Firearms Act, uh, not important. And then, oh, never mind. That's a whole other case that I have, I'm working on another issue. So if you keep going, this is what's, in, this is what's interesting right here. I've, I, I highlighted this, this quote 
because um, the Miller case says, talks about Blackstone's commentaries, points out that King Alfred first settled a national militia in this kingdom and traces the subsequent development and use of such forces. Um, it is there said, li listen to this and think about this. Men of Republican principles have been jealous of a standing army as dangerous to liberty. If you don't believe that the purpose of the Second Amendment is to be able to stand up to a potentially tyrannical standing army, you obviously don't understand or support Republican principles, which is what this country is founded on. We are a democratic republic. You know, people have uh, the ability to democratically elect their leaders to represent them at various levels. Okay, we don't have a democracy. We have a Republican democracy or a democratic republic where we democratically elect people to make decisions for us. We, the electorate, don't make those decisions all by ourselves. Um, so if you oppose, if you aren't, if you don't think that a standing army is dangerous to liberty and you oppose the right of the people to keep and bear arms as a bulwark against a potential tyrannical standing army, then you obviously don't support our form of government. You support a, a very totalitarian and communist style of government. Now let's go down here further. The possession of arms also implied the possession of ammunition. So ammunition is just as protected as is the weapons. Um, and the authorities pay quite as much attention to the latter as to the former. And now I'm going to also add this. Anything that will make your firearm more accurate, okay, because the last thing anyone should want is an inaccurate gun. Okay, if you believe in if you if you really believe in gun safety, then you really believe that a firearm should be 100% accurate and to the best and you should be able to make that firearm as accurate as possible because you don't want to shoot at Bob and accidentally hit Mary. Okay, if Bob's attacking you and you've got your sights aimed and on Bob, but because uh, your gun isn't properly uh, zeroed in, you know, it hits Mary, that's a problem. So I would also argue that the Miller case right here um, really makes a case for the fact that the Second Amendment protects anything that would make a firearm more accurate, whether it's a forward grip, whether it's uh, a, a, a long scope, uh, whether it's a red dot. So all of those things, those accessories for a firearm are just as protected as the firearm itself. Now, they used to, and I didn't highlight this, but it used to be that if you didn't have a gun, that was actually a crime. You know, there's a place um, in Georgia. It's Kennesaw, Georgia. They actually have, and I don't know if this is still the case, but it used to be back in the 2000s. Um, they actually have an ordinance in Kennesaw, Georgia, requiring <coughs> every household to have a firearm. And do you know what the crime rate in Kennesaw is? It's not very high at all. As a matter of fact, the crime rate in Kennesaw dropped by over 80% after that law or that ordinance was put into effect. So, um, again, this is going into some of the history. The musketeer, you know, the rifleman, the, the person with the gun, uh, should carry a good fixed musket, not, un not under bastard musket bore, not less than three feet, nine inches long, nor more than four feet, three inches in length, a priming wire, scour, mold, sword. This, these are all the pieces that go into being able to, uh, to make your gun function. So here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? This, this here was the law at, in many places for, for the, uh, for the, uh, the right to keep and bear arms, right? They had to have it with them, not just a gun. They had to have the ammo. They had to have the priming wire. You know what? The, the thing to be able to, to fire up the, uh, the, the powder. They had to have the scour to clean the gun, the mold, a sword, bandoliers. What is that? Those, those are where that's where you keep all of your ammunition. You had to have a pound of powder. You had to have 20 bullets um, and two fathoms of match. That's no different today than you've got to have a magazine that can carry um, enough bullets, right? So this idea of standard capacity magazines 
here's your argument against that. You can look to history and tradition to show that bans on magazine capacities violate the Second Amendment because and and bans on four grips and bans on certain types of stocks and bans on well nowadays pistol braces because they wanted to make sure that your weapon in in 1791 and and earlier they wanted to make sure that your weapon was going to be uh mechanically sound and able to be fired and used in a when it was necessary okay so moving on down oh that, i think that was the end of it uh, yeah, that was the end of it. So that's, what's very, so here's, here's why, and I'm going to go back up to this right here, because I think this, this is the most important section of this in this Miller case, the court held that at this time, let me go back up here at this time in 1939, doggone it. Where are you? Oh, right, duh, here it is. I already highlighted it. At this time, um, the, the, these three words are the death knell of the NFA. These three words are the death knell of the NFA. Okay, we don't need another case to invalidate um, the NFA on short-barreled rifles and shotguns. We have it. At this time, the possession or use of a shotgun having a barrel of less than 18 inches in length, or I would argue also having a rifle with a barrel length of less than 16 inches in length does have a reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia. We cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument at this time. But now in 2023, where it is a part of the general stock of the mil of the military and i'm going to uh i'm going to pull this up here real quick it is now the common use in the military it is a weapon that is a part of the ordinary military equipment today it can be used to contribute to the common defense both a short barreled rifle and a short barreled shotgun if not our military wouldn't use it the customs and border patrol would not use it. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to bring over a tab and I'm going to show you here M4 rifle ah, uh, specifications. And I'm going to specifically see if they have anything for the army. I, I pulled these up. I don't, I don't know where it went. Um, I don't like using Wikipedia because it's easily editable. Let's go to military.com. Here's your M4 carbine. Okay. This is what the average soldier, even in, in my field, the intel, non-infantry, almost everybody today is issued an M4 carbine. The M16s, any that are left, are generally left uh, with, you know, like the National Guard or, but even those are being phased out because even the National Guard and the reserves, um, you know, the way, the way weapons upgrades work in the military is obviously the active component gets all the upgraded stuff first. And then it slowly starts trickling down to the reserves and then to all the National Guards, okay? So this is the M4 carbine. This is what is used in the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps, and the United States Air Force. Let me go back here. Let me go back here. Any part of the ordinary military equipment, okay? Ordinary military equipment. This is very clear. And, you know, I don't need military.com to tell me what's in the more ordinary military equipment. Anybody can probably go and fill out a FOIA. And uh, this picture right here is very important, too, by the way. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, anybody can go fill out a FOIA and find out what is the standard military equipment. What is the standard small arms rifle uh, that any service uses? That is, quote, whoops. Let me go back to my. Any part of the ordinary military equipment is the M4 rifle a part of the ordinary military equipment? Yes, it is for every branch of service, probably even the Coast Guard, probably even the uh, Customs and Border Patrol. Barrel length, 14 and a half inches. That is less than the 16 inches under federal law that 
create or cr that causes a rifle to be considered a short barreled rifle. That's an inch and a half under the federal definition. So if this is the ordinary part of military equipment now for every branch of service, then it's protected. Then it's protected. All right. If it's ever been, you know, even muskets right now are muskets. Hey, let's go back to this because this is a, this is a good point here. Are muskets today an ordinary military, a part of ordinary military equipment? Anybody, can anybody tell me besides the Taliban, is there any military in the world today that uses a musket or has the musket as a, any part of its ordinary military equipment? The answer is no. They don't have flintlocks. Uh, they don't have ball and cap. Okay. So couldn't you argue that the musket is actually not protected under the second amendment? Well, you could make that argument, but it's kind of an ignorant argument because anything that can contribute to the common defense, because this is the word or, okay. If a weapon is a part of the ordinary military equipment, it's automatically protected, automatically protected because that's the point of the second amendment is to arm individuals so that they can serve in a militia if called upon to do so so automatically or even if you have something that is not in the ordinary military equipment although this this case doesn't really this case really only focuses on the first aspect of that which is the ordinary military equipment or that its use could contribute to the common defense for example and i'm going to make i'm going to make an argument here that some might not like but I'll preface it with, I think bump stocks are protected, okay, under the Second Amendment as well. But you could make an argument that a bump stock doesn't really contribute to the common defense. If you're in a firefight, the last thing you want is a bump stock because you are when you're, when you're fighting under stress, when you're shoot, move, and communicate, um, you've got to hold that bump stock in just the right way in order for that mechanism to work and fire like an automatic weapon or to fire at a higher rate of speed. A bump stock is not going to help you contribute to the common defense. Now, if you're able to just to stand there and sort of measure, lay down suppressive fire uh, where you're not under the stress of being shot at or having to worry about you know the exact pressure that you're putting on your shoulder and the firearm in order to engage the bump, um, then maybe it could be but you're not going to find any reasonable gun owner that I know of uh, or trainer or military person that's going to say that a bump stock uh, could contribute to the common defense. It can, and I still think it's protected. I'm just saying it, it, no one's going to use a bump stock in, in combat. And if you do use a bump stock in combat, just pre be prepared to constantly be charging that charging handle back. All right, because you're constantly going to have to be uh, restriking that. Um, and then, uh, so we have this bill. Let me bring up this bill that I was, uh, just looking at that was just brought in yesterday. Uh, it had a, it had a hearing yesterday and we did testify on behalf of it. And the, the great thing about this bill is it removes in Texas, at least, short barreled rifle from the uh prohibitions unless you have a tax stamp okay this is good news because and, and look my thoughts are even if this was not removed okay and there were some really good points that came up yesterday in the hearing uh even if it was not removed then it, it's still unconstitutional because a short barreled firearm is in common use now oh doggone it Oh, there it is. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to bring up something. Oh, no, that was it. I wanted to show you something that is also in common use. And I'm going to keep going back to this for uh, the next couple of minutes. Remember, a weapon that is any part of the ordinary military equipment. Now, I want to bring you back up some of these pictures here. So this is obviously a short barrel uh, rifle. It's it's an M4. Um 14 and a half inch barrel right here. Now, anybody, if you want to know what makes a, you know, where do you measure the length? 
you start from here and you measure back to where it hits the uh, the bolt carrier group. That's how you measure your barrel. So with the bolt in the forward position, that's how long uh, your barrel would be. Now, look, you've got this laser here. That's a part of ordinary military equipment. You've got the ACOG here. That's part of ordinary military equipment. You've got your 30 round magazine. That's part of ordinary military equipment. I would even argue you've got your selector lever here. Now, um, most M4s in the military are not fully automatic. They're what's called a three round burst. You can hold the trigger down. It'll shoot three shot, three shots uh, with one trigger squeeze. And then you got to do it again for three. Now there are some of course that are fully automatic but the vast majority of M4s in the military are semi-automatic or three round burst. So all of these things, okay, all of these things. And I like that he's got the backup iron sights because you never know when your ACOG is going to go down your ACOG or your red dot, um, your, uh, laser here foregrip. Uh, there's a flashlight. You can barely see the flashlight over here. All of these are in the military. These are all, part of the common military. Now, let me show you what else is also in the standard military. What do you notice in this picture here? What do you think? You still got everything else. You've got the, uh, you know, the adjustable stock. You've got the ACOG. You got the 30 round magazine. You've got the safe to semi. And uh, uh, right now he's in three round burst, it looks like. Um, because it'd be the other way around if it was in safe. So he's he's now either in fully auto or three round burst mode right here. But what else do you notice in here that is a common part of this military equipment? Right there, a suppressor. So even suppressors, I would argue, if I were to uh, you know, be in court and have a defendant that is charged with violating the NFA because he's got a suppressor or a short barreled rifle, that look, we've already got case law. This needs to be dismissed. The NFA is unconstitutional because under the Miller standard, um, any weapon that is a any part of the ordinary military equipment is protected. It's protected. Or even if it can be used in the common defense, it's protected under the Miller standard. So we don't really need new case law. What we need to do is, is recognize that Yes, back then in 1939, when this case was held, short barreled rifles and short barreled shotguns were not a part of the ordinary military equipment. But you know what's not a part of the ordinary military equipment today? Is muskets. But I would argue that even weapons that were a part of the ordinary military equipment or good for the common defense are always going to be protected. Even if we move on, as a matter of fact, the, uh, let me bring this back up and show you. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to show you this. Uh, there's a few more pictures here of, you know, flashlights and all the things that here's a, uh, EOTech. This is what I had in Afghanistan. I used an EOTech actually. I didn't get an ACOG. Um, Oh, look at this. I see an M203 grenade launcher here. That's an ordinary part of military equipment right there. M203. So I would even argue that Miller says this is legal. All right. Um, I think I got all that stuff, but I want to show you this uh, army M4. Cause I think the army just, uh, just had, just went into, yeah, there it is. Yeah, April of last year. They just signed a contract. This is going to be the new saw, and this is going to replace the uh, the M4. This is Sig Sauer's uh, weapons here, weapon systems. These are the next generation squad weapon prototypes. Um, I thought there were other pictures here. But this obviously doesn't look like, I, and I don't know what the specifications are of this at this point. Let me see if I can figure it out. XM5 rifle specs. All right, dang it. I'm going to, uh, here we go. XM5. Yes, I'm 18 years old. All right. Do, do, do. Let's see if this talks about the specifications here. The Army's released the XM5 listed as the overall length, width, 
a width suppressor attached is 36 inches. Remember, uh, it's got to be at least 26 inches. But it's got a 15.3 inch barrel. So even the new replacement to the M4 is going to be considered a short barreled rifle and it's going to be protected under the Miller standard. Therefore, that is why Texas is doing a good thing by getting rid of the short barreled rifle out of its out of its uh, definition of a prohibited weapon under 4605. All right, this stuff is all protected. Um I wanted to go over this with you again, look up the case yourself. And, uh, you can see that if, um, you know, Texas went and got rid of, if you've got a, a, a suppressor that was, uh, built and sold and remains in the state of Texas, uh, it, the NFA doesn't apply. All right. And you don't have to worry if it's a Texas made suppressor. And now this would also apply to the short barreled rifles. Um, and, and would also get around this, uh, unconstitutional ATF rule. By the way, if you're still confused about the rule, I did do a video about the pistol brace rule. Don't think that you're about to become a felon. You're not. Okay. You may not. Let me just put it that way. You may not. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, people saying that just by having the pistol brace, even if it's not on a gun, you're a felon. That's false. Um, I'll just reiterate really quickly to keep this under 45 minutes that, it's it only becomes a short barreled rifle if you put a particular brace on a particular rifle. And there are several uh, elements that they look into in determining whether or not a pistol is converted into a rifle based on on that criteria. OK, so don't just think that just because you've got a pistol brace, all of a sudden you're a felon. You likely are not likely or not. Um, but of course, we're going to have to get this through the courts or. Uh, we're going to need the uh, the legislatures to invalidate this unconstitutional rule. All right, guys. Really quick, let me see what's going on here. If I missed any uh, comments. Uh, oh, it is still an ordinance in Alabama, uh, Georgia. Good, good, good. Kennesaw, Georgia. Uh, they did they did envision types of weapons and exactly why they clearly printed arms. Yep, exactly. Um, yep. Second Amendment tax. Tax, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, thank you for, um, so uh, really quick, if you would like to donate, um, my PayPal is cj at cjgrisham.com. My uh, Venmo is at cjgrisham. And my cash app is dollar sign cjgrisham. Very simple, very simple. If you're watching on the Open Carry Texas uh, channel, you can donate to Open Carry Texas via PayPal at admin at opencarrytexas.org, admin at opencarrytexas.org if you want to donate to Open Carry Texas because I am simulcasting this on both the OCT and my personal channel, CJ Grisham. Um, all right, guys, that's it. You guys take care, be safe, be free. If there's something else you would like me to cover um, that you think needs to be explained a little bit better, send me an email, cj at cjgrisham.com. And I will help explain something uh, that the government has made incredibly difficult to understand, which is just about everything they do. Um, and with that, I'll see y'all next time. Y'all take care. Be safe. Be free.